our midweek service here at Heritage Baptist Church. We are so happy that you have chosen to join with us tonight. And of course, as always, it is our uh, prayerful desire that uh, the message this evening would be a blessing, a help, encouragement in each heart and in each life. If you have your Bibles, let's turn together to the Gospel of John in chapter 6. The Gospel of John, chapter 6. If you remember, we saw a couple of weeks ago how that the Apostle John in his gospel, uh, he would skip over events. And in fact, he would skip over periods of time. And I mentioned that again this evening because that's exactly what we're going to see him doing in this chapter that we're going to begin looking at tonight. In the last chapter, you remember, we saw the Lord Jesus was in the city of Jerusalem. It was the Passover time in 28 AD. And and so he was there in the city of Jerusalem, there by the pool of Bethesda. He healed a crippled man. There was that serious confrontation with the religious leaders. But now the Apostle John is going to fast forward once again. He's going to fast forward, in fact, for about a whole year from the spring of 28 A.D. until the spring of 29 A.D. And we know that this is the case because in John chapter 6, verse 4, we're immediately told that the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. However, we do know from the synoptic gospels, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we know that this second full year of ministry had been a very busy time for the Lord Jesus. In fact, John Phillips in his commentary wrote some two dozen incidents recorded in the synoptic gospels are wholly ignored by John. It's during this period that the Lord Jesus, for example, uh, spent all night in prayer in Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and verse number 13. And, And then he chose those 12 apostles after spending all night in prayer. By the way, uh, every major decision in our lives ought to be bathed in prayer. And so he spent all night in prayer and then and then he chose 12 apostles. And then in Mark chapter 3 verse 13 to verse 14, he sent them out on a preaching tour in Galilee. We also find that there were two additional preaching tours through Galilee. And after that, the Lord Jesus said to his disciples in Mark chapter 6 verse 31, he said, "Come ye yourselves apart, into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And it is here now that the Apostle John is going to continue his story. He's going to give a demonstration of the authority of the Lord Jesus by focusing on his power in in verse 1 to verse 21 of this sixth chapter. And then he's also going to give a demonstration of the authority of the Lord Jesus by focusing on his preaching in verse 22 down to verse number 40. So let's begin number one. Let's begin by noticing the power of the Lord Jesus the power of the Lord Jesus. In John chapter 6, begin reading in verse number 1, the Bible says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. Now, this provides us with the setting for two great miracles. This is the setting for two powerful miracles uh, that we're going to see in this chapter. First of all, there is the miracle of the feeding of the multitude. Feeding the multitude. As as the Lord Jesus sat on the mountain with his disciples, uh, the Bible says in verse number five that Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. Now, according to Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 21, there were, there were 5,000 men plus women 
and children. In fact, some commentators have said that there may have been as many as 15 to 20,000 people who were present on this occasion. But the interesting thing that I want us to notice here is that instead of being upset with these people who were infringing on the time of rest that was so badly needed, remember the Lord Jesus told his disciples, come apart, let's rest for a while. But instead of being upset with those who were infringing on his, on his rest time, the Bible says in Mark 6, 34, that he was moved with compassion toward them because they were his sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And so with a heart full of compassion for these people, the Lord Jesus gives up his time of rest and he begins to teach these people the wonderful truths of God's holy word. But I want you to notice that in teaching many things, which is what Mark tells us in Mark chapter 6, verse 34, I want you to understand that te teaching many things requires much time. It requires much time. And so as the sun began to sink toward the rest western horizon, uh, the disciples come to the Lord Jesus. Uh, you can read about it in Mark chapter 14 and verse 15, in Mark chapter 6, verse 35 and verse 36, in Luke chapter 9, verse 12. Uh, in each one of those, we find that the disciples came to the Lord Jesus and they, they informed him, first of all, that, that it was getting late. And they also informed him that dinner time is coming and the people are hungry. And, and, and then after informing him of those things, they then advised him. And they advised him that since there was no town nearby, there, there was no, no place to buy food that was nearby, that, that they ought to send the multitudes away so that they could go into the town and, and, and find food to eat. And it's here that the Apostle John now is going to tell us about four things. First of all, we find the testing of the disciples. The testing of the disciples. In, in John chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. You, you see the Lord Jesus as omniscient God. He, he knows all things. He, he knew what was going to happen. He knew how this was all going to work out. He knew exactly what he was going to do to meet the needs of these people who are crowding around him. But, but the test for the disciples is the Lord Jesus says, what are we going to do? He knew, but they didn't know. And so the test is, what are we going to do? Well, here we find number two, the failure of the disciples. You, you know, it's kind of sad that none of the disciples, none of the disciples, when the Lord Jesus asked the question, none of the disciples said, well, Lord, since you are the one who fed Elijah by the brook Cherith, what will you do? What will you do? But, it, but instead of that, I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, they considered what they had. They considered what they had. I, I think when the Lord Jesus asked Philip about uh, buying bread for the multitude, he, he probably turned to Judas Iscariot, who was the treasurer for the little group. John chapter 13, verse 29 tells us that he carried the bag. He was the treasurer. And so Philip probably turned to Judas Iscariot to see how much they have in the kitty. Uh, how, how much do we have on hand? And, and immediately he knew that with this size of a crowd, they don't have enough. They're, they're going to be short. And, and so then he turns to the other disciples, perhaps, and, and, and he collected an offering from them. And, and so when they took what was in the kitty and when they took what had been ex, uh, received from the other disciples, they, they, they tallied it all up. And so Philip comes to the Lord Jesus in verse 7 with his answer. He said, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them 
that every one of them may take a little. But not only did they consider what they had, uh, they also considered what another had. The, the Bible says in verse 8 and verse 9 that one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes. But what are they among so many? Uh, here's the bottom line I want you to understand. These disciples were absolutely convinced that when the Lord Jesus asked them, how are we going to feed this great multitude of people? They were convinced that the Lord Jesus was expecting something from them that was absolutely impossible. That, that the Lord was asking something of them that was humanly beyond the veil of possibility. But then I want you to notice number three. There is the employment of the disciples. First of all, we see them employed in the placements. This was not like a potluck fellowship at church where, where people flocked to the food like vultures to a carcass that, and, and, and kind of hovered. No, that, that wasn't it at all. Uh, this placement, this placement, it was to be done decently. It, it was to be done in order. Notice what the Bible says in verse 10. Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down and number about 5,000. Over in the Gospel of Mark, a parallel passage in Mark chapter 6, verse 40, we find that they didn't just sit anywhere, but rather they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And so the, the disciples were employed in, in seating the people in a decent, orderly way. Not only do we see the employment of the disciples in the placement, we also see them employed in the serving. In verse number 11, Jesus took the loaves, the Bible says, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down and likewise of the fishes as many as they would. And so here is the Lord Jesus breaks the bread and he breaks the fish and, and, and it, it, be, it multiplies and then he gives it to the disciples and they, they then take it and, and, and distribute it to the people uh, so that they might eat. Uh, we see them involved. We see them employed, not only in the placement. We see them involved and employed in the, in the serving. And then, and then also I want you to notice we see them employed in the gathering. In, in verse 12 and verse 13, the Bible says that when they were filled, when they were filled, in other words, these disciples, they're continually going back and forth, feeding this multitude. And, and now when everybody is filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them to gather and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten, had eaten. Now, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate about, well, what happened? What happened to those 12 baskets full of leftovers? What, what, what became of that? Well, my, my personal opinion, my personal opinion is that they went home with that little boy who had so freely given his lunch to the Lord Jesus. And, and, and the reason I personally believe that, it's, it, it's based on the, on the scripture that we find in, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38, uh, where the Bible says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. This little boy gave everything he had. He gave everything that he had to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord multiplied it abundantly and gave it back to him. That's exactly what we find promised in the scripture. And so we see the employment of the disciples in the feeding of the multitude. But then I want you to notice number four, there is the protection of the disciples. The protection of the disciples. The Bible says in verse 14 and verse 15, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, 
This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. And when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king. You remember we've seen before, uh, the Lord knows what is in the hearts of all men. He, he, he knows what is in the hearts of men. And, and the Lord knew that these men were desiring to make him a king. After they've seen this wonderful miracle, their desire is that, that he should be their king. And so the Lord did two things. He did two things. First of all, notice in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22, we find that straightway, that is immediately, Immediately, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. You, you see, here's the thing. The Lord Jesus knew the will of his Father. He knew the will of his Father and therefore he knew that it was not yet time for him to be made a king. Now that's going to come later. Jesus Christ is going to come at the second coming of Christ, and he is going to rule and reign over all the nations of the world from the throne of David, and he's going to rule as the, as, as the king of, of, all of all of the nations. But, but this, this was not the time. To do, the, to do so now would be to get ahead of the will of God. And so to protect his disciples from becoming caught up in the emotion, uh, to protect his disciples from being caught up in the moment, the Lord Jesus sent them away. He sent them away. And then the Bible says in verse 15 that he departed again into a mountain himself alone. He goes up into the mountain alone. And that brings us then to the second miracle, which would be walking on water. After being sent away, the Bible says in verse 16 and verse 17, it says that when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. Now, I want you to notice the disciples, they're exactly where they were supposed to be. These disciples, they're, they're doing exactly what the Lord Jesus had commanded them to do. But being in the place of obedience does not mean that everything is going to be smooth and easy in our life. So many times, as, even as Christians, when, when we begin to face some kind of difficulty, one of the first things that pops into our mind, one of the first questions that comes to our thinking is, what did I do wrong? Well, I want you to notice these fellows, they did not do anything wrong. They're exactly where the Lord Jesus told them to be. They're doing exactly what the Lord Jesus told them to do. And yet now we find they're going to be faced with a storm. I want you to notice a couple of things here. In fact, there's five things that we're going to just mention very briefly. First of all, I want you to notice the frightening sense. The frightening sense. In John 6, 17, the Bible says that it was now dark and Jesus was not come to them. In other words, they're where they were supposed to be. They were doing what they were supposed to do. And yet they felt like they were all alone because Jesus was not with them. However, however, the reality is, even though, even though they could not sense his presence, we find a wonderful little statement in a parallel passage. Mark chapter 6, verse 48. Here's what it says. It says, he saw them toiling and rowing. They couldn't see him. They, they had no sense of his presence, and yet his eyes was watching them. He was watching over them. But because they could not see him with their eyes, there was a frightening sense that they were all alone. And, and, and then that was made even worse. That was made even worse by number two. There was the frightening storm. 
The Bible says in verse 18 that the sea arose by reason of a great wind and blew. In other words, those disciples are caught in a dangerous storm of wind that caused the, the high waves and the deep swells. And, 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 and so they're caught in this, in this frightening storm. And then, and then thirdly, there is a, there's a frightening stay. A frightening stay. You know, by Jewish, re uh, by Jewish reckoning of time, uh, it was evening, as we find in John 6, 16. It was evening, uh, which means it was about 6 p.m. or sunset. It's around sunset when the disciples began their journey. But then we find in a parallel passage again in Matthew chapter 14 and verse 25 that it was the fourth watch of the night that Jesus went unto them. Now the fourth watch of the night would begin at three o'clock in the morning. In, in other words, these men have been toiling for nine long hours against a storm of wind that was contrary to them. In other words, it was a storm of wind so that every bit of progress that they made was immediately pushed backward. And, and so it's, it, it's, it's forward and back and forward and back. And, and, and nine long hours they have been toiling in this storm, in this storm of wind. Now, now it would have been natural. It would have been natural for, for, for those men to ask the question, uh, Lord Jesus, when are you going to deliver us from this storm? W when are you going to deliver us from this frightening storm? W w when are you going to come and, and, and help us out? A and about the time they thought things could get any worse, uh, that's when they then had, number four, the frightening sight. In verse number 19, so when they had rode about five and twenty or three, fur, or uh, twenty five and twenty or thirty furlongs, which would have been about halfway across the Sea of Galilee, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. Uh, certainly, they must have thought, the, see this figure clothed in a white robe. He's walking across the sea, and, and, and as the waves come up, they see him, and then he goes down into the swell, and then, and then he comes back up, and he's drawing nearer and nearer and nearer. Certainly, they thought that this was the death angel coming to end their lives on this earth. They are, they are afraid. They are filled with fear. But then they hear those wonderful, those wonderful words of comfort. In verse number 20, he said unto them, it is I, it is I, be not afraid, be not afraid. And then there is number five, the fabulous salvation. In verse 21, then they willingly received him into the ship and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Nine hours, they've been toiling, didn't get anywhere. But when Jesus comes on the scene, immediately, they arrive at their destination. Now we're out of time and we're going to have to consider the preaching of the Lord Jesus next time that we meet together. But as we consider these two miracles which reveal the mighty power of God, we might ask the question, if he has such power, why? Why does he allow times of personal want like those hungry people? And, and, and why does he allow times of frightening circumstances to come into our lives? Let me close with an illustration from the world of nature. We know from science that both sodium and chlorine are poisonous to humans. And, and, and yet when they are mixed together, when those two compounds, both of them poisonous, but when they're mixed together in the right way, 40% sodium and 60% chlorine, when they're mixed together in the right way, they become salt. And we all know that salt is something that is, it's good for our health and, and, and it's great for flavoring our food and it's really good when we put it on french fries. But that's exactly what God does in our lives.
That's exactly what God does in our lives. You remember the Apostle Paul said, Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, please understand, this promise, it's not for everybody. This promise is not for everybody. This is a promise that is only for those lovers of God who have been called according to his purpose to salvation. In other words, it is for those who have been called to become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's for those who are truly loving God now by obeying his word and, and walking in his ways. Those are the ones to whom the promise is given that every time of want and every time of danger that God allows to come into our lives, it is for our good. In other words, God takes those circumstances that we think of as being something that is poisonous. We look at those circumstances and think of them as being something that is terrible. And yet he takes those very circumstances and he weaves them together in exactly the right proportion. And he makes those things to become something that is both good for us and glorifying to him. The bottom line is this. God allows our difficulties so that when we see him working in the circumstances of our life, our faith will grow stronger and our worship will grow sweeter. If you do not know him as your savior, I hope, I hope that even tonight that you would consider that you would consider the wonderful message of the gospel, which declares that God so loved you that he gave his son to die for you so that through faith in him, you might have the wonderful hope of eternal life. And if you are a Christian, may God help us to love him, to serve him, to obey him as we should, trusting him completely that in every situation that he allows to come into our lives, it is truly because he's going to do something good for us and he's going to glorify himself. Lord, we do thank you this evening for your word. Take these few thoughts, apply them in each heart and in each life according to our need. And Lord, I pray for the one who does not yet know Christ as their savior. May, may they soon come to put their faith and trust in him. And for those of us who are saved, regardless of the dangers or the times of need that we may face in our life, uh, Lord, may our trust in you never fail. May we never forget that you are weaving all of those things together into something that's going to be good for us. May we trust you in that. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with us and hope that you'll meet with us again at the next appointed time. Until then, may God bless you. Thank you.